Episode 225 of CPP Cast with guest Bjorn Faller, recorded November 26, 2019. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the only cross platform crash reporting solution that automates the manual effort out of debugging. Get the context you need to resolve crashes in one interface for Linux, Windows, mobile, and gaming platforms. Check out their new Visual Studio extension for C and claim your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. And by JetBrains, makers of smart IDEs to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. Exclusively for CPPCast, JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for a yearly individual license, new or update, on the C tool of your choice C Lion, Resharper C, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPPCast during checkout at www.jetbrains.com. In this episode, we first talk more about C++ ABI stability. Then we talk to Bjorn Faller. Bjorn talks to us about cache friendliness and the future of C++ contracts. Welcome to episode 225 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how's it going today? I am doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, looking forward to the upcoming holidays, although we should mention that uh, I think this episode will come out after Thanksgiving if you're in the US. Uh, we'll probably be missing that week, but we will okay. be back for uh, December. That's reasonable. Yeah. I am. Well, since this will be airing then, currently in the Czech Republic, and Bruno having just finished uh, one set of training on the trip that I'm currently on. Do you have any plans for what you're going to do for Thanksgiving while you're abroad? Are you you trying to celebrate it in any way? Yeah, my mom actually, like, asked where we're going to be for Thanksgiving, and I'm like, I I don't even know. (laughs) And then I decided I'll be in Prague. Okay. And uh, she told me, she's like, oh, well, the last couple of years that we've been in, in... Europe for Thanksgiving, we managed to find turkeys. And I'm like, to me, it really just doesn't matter that much. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm going to be doing a day of training and then I'm going to relax. Okay. And that'll be my holiday, right? Like, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, it's just, I don't know. Yes, I always celebrate Thanksgiving as an American when I'm home, but when I'm traveling, if it's going to come up, it just doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me no need to go through the effort extra effort to try to find a turkey or something like that yeah no no and this is ridiculous cooking a turkey at an airbnb for the two of us <laughs> makes no sense at all yeah i agree uh, what about you big family plans uh no i think we're just doing uh thanksgiving local here this year my family's going to come by the following weekend yeah oh okay so also relatively quiet no friends giving or whatever uh, i don't think so this year no okay well um, enjoy i'm <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got a, a lot of tweets after last week's episode. Uh, this one is from Barney Deller, and he wrote, uh, Two of my favorite tech topics collide on CBPcast, C++ and systems thinking. We have created an ecosystem of dependencies, and it has unintended emergent behavior. We now have old libraries that we can't recompile, but that we depend on. But now we can't update our core language to be faster, or we'll no longer be able to use these old libraries Emergent behavior is hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like we could have gotten into a, you know, we could have just kept that discussion going about ABI for a lot longer. And I look forward to seeing how the committee responds to, uh, to Titus's proposal when he does present that ABI paper next year. Well, and I think well, we have a news item coming up today mm-hmm. that definitely adds to this topic for me. I mean, we'll yeah. discuss that in a moment, but yeah. I still am uh, strongly in the camp of, well, you should be in a world where you can rebuild the world. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, if depending on binaries that you don't have the source code to, that's always going to be a problem. It's, it's bad. It's real bad. And, yeah. and one thing I thought of, which I forgot to bring up when we had Titus, is it seems to me like the people who are depending on these old binaries 
and can't rebuild them are not necessarily the same people who want to jump on the new C++ standard, right? Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there goes our, our guest. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true, though, because you might have some business legacy reason that the sure. you know there might be three quarters of the people who are ready to move forward, but one quarter of the people rely on this old binary, and that's going to take a big engineering effort to get rid of it. I've even heard about people who have um, some built library that they depend on, but for whatever reason, no longer have access to to the sources to. So, tough for them. Yeah, yeah I think I heard, and I don't remember if it was with Titus or someone else mentioned, maybe you lost the source. Right. Which hopefully that doesn't happen, but it, I know it does. I mean, for those of us who are into retro gaming stuff, we hear stories about like, oh, they found some old computer from uh, Team... 17 or whatever who made worms and they found the old source code from that thing on the thing that's like had been lost and forgotten for 30 years you know whatever like these things do happen mm -hmm. but inside of it i'd really hope it doesn't well we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show you can always reach out to us on facebook twitter or email us at feedback at cbcast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes or subscribe on youtube uh joining us today you just heard him is bjorn Faller. Bjorn works for NetInsight, where he wears many hats, including mentor, trainer, troubleshooter, networking, protocol designer, software architect, and programmer, and he is continuously pushing the code base to increasingly modern C++. Programming has been his full-time profession since graduating from university in 94, mostly writing embedded software for networking equipment. Bjorn first experienced programming when home computers became popular in the early 80s, and it quickly became a permanent interest of his. Occasionally, Bjorn has been seen tinkering with unorthodox software constructs, pondering what can be done with this. He lives in Stockholm. Bjorn, welcome to the show again. Thank you for having me again. I have two questions from your current bio. The first right. is, I don't believe in any of your conference talks that I have seen, anyhow, that you mention network protocol design. True. Um, I haven't found much reason to talk about them. Uh, the, all my... All my conference talks, or all of them, as, is, as if there were a lot, uh, have been about uh, programming issues, more or less generic programming issues. Yeah. So uh, in our conversation with Titus the other week, it was uh, he, he made this um, analogy between ABIs and network protocols. And now a, a well-designed network protocol has a version number, and you know if you're talking the right version to someone else, but our ABIs don't really seem to be doing that so much. Yeah, um, I guess that's um, largely why we are where we are. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, the other thing that I was just curious about is this note that you graduated from university in 94. I graduated in 96, but I believe you are more than two years older than I am. So I'm just kind of curious if you went to university later or if you have a PhD. I do not have a PhD. I... I was late to, into university, so I worked for a while doing um, electronics design. Oh, interesting. interesting. Do you still continue that hobby at all? Uh, no, not at all. No, no. <laughs> still, no, I, I have a multimeter that I can use to troubleshoot things, uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that's pretty much it. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, well, Bjorn, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Feel free to comment on any mm -hmm. of these, and then we'll start talking more about what you've been up to, okay? All right. Okay, so this first one is a blog post on the JetBrains uh, ReSharper C++ blog, um, and it's from Phil Nash, uh, C++20 and ReSharper C++. And this is just going over how, you know, with C++20 kind of more or less uh, set in stone, you can start to test out some of the new features if you want to, if, if you're using ReSharper C++ and uh choose to use the uh, C++ latest option uh, in Visual Studio. You can see some of the new features, and he goes over in the post uh, aggregate initialization and designated initialization and, and how you can see that and, you know, how it lights up in the, uh, in the IDE. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I wonder if this is, like, the first of a series of other C++ 20 stuff where he's going to go over, um, or if it's just the first stuff that's uh, available for, like, testing out right now with the latest ReSharper. I feel like we saw an earlier article a while ago about something else, C plus plus twenty with That's possible. Sea Lion, but now I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Sea Lion has uh oh, okay. 
it's currently in uh, beta, I guess, the uh, the next version that will have some uh, C plus twenty stuff uh, concepts among them. Okay, and I think part of the difference here is ReSharper C plus plus is keeping trying to keep parity with um, with Visual Studio specifically since it's a plugin for Visual Studio. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next thing we have is a blog post on performance matters uh, and it's Clang format tanks performance, which is a, a bit of a clickbaity title. Um, but in in the post, he's doing some testing on uh, calling two upper and uh-huh. finds that uh, depending on your um, include order, that performance could be altered significantly. Uh, this was pretty interesting. It was my cousin who does reach, uh uh, Rust development mm-hmm. sent me this article a few days ago, and I was like, "What the heck?" And I read it, and I haven't responded to him yet, actually. Um, but yeah, that's it, it. Was an interesting read because you just got into more and more of, of uh, surprises that kept popping up, and uh, but it turned out to not be so mysterious in the end. But it was a fun article. Uh, so for the sake of our uh, listeners. If you include, let's see if I can get this right. If you include C type before algorithm is included, then it uh, basically breaks inlining of two upper. Is that right? I think it was the other way around. If you have C type oh, okay. first, uh, then uh, then C then two upper is uh, inlined perfectly. But but if you include algorithm first, it defines some Mac grow that is checked for in the C type header and it breaks in lining yeah uh, yeah weird i mean it's like a problem with having a macro based include system i guess right copy and paste of these things yeah, yeah. Uh, though it makes me work i wonder if it'll kind of accidentally be fixed when we and what c++ 23 or whatever get the um, modularized modularized library, and library oh, headers yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Hope. Let's hope for that. That's great. So in five years, we'll all have a fixed version. <laughs> <laughs> can finally do two upper in ASCII. <laughs> okay, and then this last article is a blog post on intricacies of ABI stability, and uh, this definitely relates to the conversation we had last week with Titus. Um, so this post kind of goes over what some of the problems are with ABI and then goes into one proposed solution uh, where the author is basically suggesting that um, we could change the way we do name, mang- name mangling between ABI versions. So yeah. that you wouldn't have, you know, one version of a function, you know, overriding, uh, you know, breaking one definition rule with some other version of a function. Is that basically what this is saying, Jason? Yes, yes. Uh, and Clang and GCC use the Itanium ABI specification with their mangled names. Visual Studio does a different name mangling. Right. So Visual Studio have to take some different approach. I'm curious if Bjorn, if you have any opinion on this uh, as well. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I happily live in this world where I, where we always recompile everything. So it, it's never been an issue for me personally. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, I understand what the, uh, what the blog post says about about the uh, using the mangling to to get a differentiation between the between the symbols in the different versions of the ABI, but that that's pretty much the extent of it for me. Okay. Well, with this uh, proposed solution, it would either become a compile time link error because it couldn't find that, or if it was some runtime loading of a shared library, then we might get a runtime link error, a runtime error if it can't find the symbol when it goes to load the DLL or SO or whatever, or dilib. Right, and that'd certainly be better than, I guess, what would happen now, which would just be a runtime error when the ABI boundary is, you know, doesn't match, basically. No, that's the best case scenario is a runtime crash. The most right. likely scenario is undefined behavior land, True. and we don't know what state our application's in. Right, right. That's much worse. Yeah. Okay. Well, Bjorn, um, we wanted to have you on the show because we just saw that you were uh, giving a code dive talk along with uh, Jason recently, or you know, along with Jason yep. being, uh, being at code dive, and yes. you did a talk on uh, cache friendliness, which seemed to be getting a lot of uh, 
attention on Twitter, at least. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that talk. Yeah, okay, so th this talk was uh, pretty much a hands-on thing to show uh, what cache effects actually are, how you can profile them and, and see where you have bottlenecks, what what is causing them, and see how you can model your software in a different way and see the performance gains that you can get. So this was, as I actually mentioned in the introduction to to that talk, this is pretty much the talk I wish that someone had given to me uh, many, many years ago because I would have written faster software if I had. Okay, so what are some of the main things that you discovered uh, or that you would like to convey? Okay, uh, for everybody who is uh, already aware of uh, how to write with the, the cache in mind, this will not be anything new, but uh, for those who, who don't, then, uh, well, to begin with, this only works in languages like C++ where you have mm -hmm. uh, access to, to how your data structures are laid out in memory. If, if you don't have that control, then there's not much you can do. But if you can, then uh, rule number one is for small data sets and uh, linear access rules. It's super fast. Uh, the problem is, of course, is to know how, how small is small. Uh, my experience typically is that, de depending on the size of your elements, but uh, at least a few hundred elements is usually usually good for a linear axis. And uh, okay. relate, related to that is to keep the, the working part of your data structure small. So if possible, you can maybe split your data structure into to two parts. One, one part that you keep as small as possible that with data that is moving around and that refers to other data that is the, more or less static hmm. uh, so that you will uh, well touch as few uh, unique memory addresses as possible while you make changes to, to the structure. Uh, the one that is maybe surprising that a number of attendees uh, said that they had never thought about this is that uh, depending on the system, if, if, if you have a, a data structure that is used here and there in a program that, uh, that does a lot of things, then if your data structure will, if the operations on your data structure will evict fewer cache entries, that means that the rest of your program has more of its data in hot cache. So mm -hmm. when you do this kind of optimization, it may actually be worth to choose not the best performer, but the one that evicts the fewest cache lines, which may not be the fastest one. But since that means that the rest of the program has more of its uh, data in hot cache, the, the overall program performance can be better. And, yeah. and one thing, that, yeah, sorry, Jason. No, no, as I said, definitely surprised a bunch of people, including myself. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah. And another that surprised me, even though I actually knew about it, was that uh, uh, a mispredicted branch can still uh, evict data from uh, from the cache. So that is, that is Spectre for you. Uh, and this can... <laughs> This can lead to extremely surprising results when you do the cache profiling and run and see that how. So I, I actually had this happen to me when I prepared the presentation and I found that Linux Perf showed that I had more evicted, more cache misses than I had data accesses. I was like, how is that ever possible? <laughs> but that is because uh, the, the misprediction led to an evicted cache line, but since it was a misprediction, it, it didn't count as a data access. So, <laughs> confusion. And you showed this uh, live, what, on like the fourth try, it showed 106% cache miss or something like that? I don't remember yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, just, just over 100%. And yeah, that, that is pretty confusing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and that is uh, also a problem. I, since I'm using Linux, I, I use uh, Linux Perf for um, for the cache profiling. And a problem with uh, Linux Perf is the enormous number of uh, counters that you can use to, to observe the system, and it's really hard to know which ones are, are good to use. So uh, there was a, a short rant by Travis Downs, who, who wrote about this to Upper, by the way, uh, mm. about the uh, the perf counters, what they mean, how what which you should choose depending on what you're looking for. So, uh, 
You also sewed using uh, Valgrind with its uh, cache simulator. How would you compare its reliability versus uh, the perf counters? Uh, well, it has two things going for it compared to perf. Uh, and one is that you can actually choose to, to simulate a cache that that doesn't look like the, the cache on the machine that you're running on. So mm. this can be useful if you're doing, uh, normally do embedded stuff, you could do cross compilation for another CPU, but you want to do your performance tuning with uh, good visibility and you can, on your development machine. And then to just say that, yeah, by the way, on, on, for this run, assume that we have 32 bytes cache entries and the uh, four kilobyte uh, L1 cache, whatever, and set the associativity also. So th- that is definitely something uh, uh, the Vowel Green does a lot better because Linux Perf will just tell you what the host CPU, uh, what it has observed about the host CPU. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is that many of the counters in, uh, in Perf are... Uh, the granularity on where they are counted uh, can be confusing, but, uh, and I'm not sure how much of that is how the counters behave. I think there's di- this difference between counters, but also because Perf uses uh, statistical sampling. So, sure, uh, if you have a performance hotspot, you, you will hit that hotspot often, um, obviously, but it, it may, for example, give you say that you have a cache miss on uh, an instruction that doesn't touch memory, which uh, so can be confusing. So you have to so, sort of interpret the results from Perth a little bit carefully and see where, where can this cache miss actually come from. Uh, but the downside of, um, of uh, Valgrind is that it's super slow. Right. Uh, 20x slowdown is uh, nothing special it can definitely be worse than that <laughs> that is a showstopper for some people depending on the nature yeah. of the application yes exactly but uh, but if you if you have isolated a small uh, a small test program a benchmark program that is tailored for understanding the cache behavior of your data structure then yeah maybe it definitely works that was actually how uh, I showed in this presentation uh, the, the final version. I, I solved the same problem over and over and over again with uh, faster techniques. And the, the last one I used was a, a, a data structure called the Bee Heap. And uh, this Bee Heap was originally developed with the with the aid of um, of the Valgrind's cache grind. Mm. Well, that's- Another comment you made during the talk that really uh, stood out to me, and I, I just actually shared it with my students um, today, was you said, assume that any pointer in direction is a cache miss. Yeah, um, definitely, unless you have very specific uh, information to the contrary that you, you know that this will be in hot cache. But yeah, but as a rule of thumb, assume that chasing pointers means you're, you're missing cache entries. Yeah. Wow. I think that, you know, most people think, oh, well, it's just, you know, it's just an allocation. It's not a big deal. It's whatever. But that sounds pretty yeah, but important it, to me. It's not a problem if it is uh, the occasional pointer that you must follow. That, that is not a problem. But if you're in hot path, you follow different pointers all the time. Like as, like when you're traversing a data structure, say that you're traversing a, a map, which is a red, black yeah. tree. You're following pointers everywhere, and they are everywhere in memory so there is no way a prefetcher can know where to read next so every time you follow a pointer assume it's a cache miss so that i mean that really speaks pretty poorly of map and set and list and forward list yep <laughs> okay <laughs> do we know if uh, the code dive talk will be available online eventually that is uh, what i understand the word there were two tracks uh, on that conference that were uh, live streamed to YouTube, so they are already uh, available as well, it's each of them as one huge uh, uh, video but where mm-hmm. you just have entries of where, where to watch for a specific talk. But uh, I understand that all talks will end up on YouTube. 
Yeah, mine was live streamed, which was quite the surprise to me when someone told me that they had just watched the talk from Germany or something. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other kind of favorite tips or anything from the cash friendliness talk that you wanted to share? Uh, measure, 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 measure. It, it's, uh, it, it's, what I mentioned now are, are just rules of thumb. They're, they're, which means that they will most of the time be worth something, but occasionally they will be just plain wrong. So you, you have to measure and, and uh, uh, then try to figure out why you're observing what you're observing. Try something else. Try to see, measure again, see wh- why do you observe the change that you're observing. So it's, it's that. <laughs> okay. I want to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is the only cross-platform crash and exception reporting solution that automates all the manual work needed to capture, symbolicate, dedupe, classify, prioritize, and investigate crashes in one interface. Backtrace customers reduce engineering team time spent on figuring out what crashed, why, and whether it even matters by half or more. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of app environmental state. It then analyzes process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. Whether you work on Linux, Windows, mobile, or gaming platforms, Backtrace can take pain out of crash handling. Check out their new Visual Studio extension for C++ developers. Companies like Fastly, Amazon, and Comcast use Backtrace to improve software stability. It's free to try, minutes to set up, with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. Uh, you also gave some talks on contracts earlier in the year, uh, and I wanted to know uh, what your take was when the feature was taken out of C++20. Mm-hmm. Were you disappointed by that? Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> I was I was surprised, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I did not expect that. But uh, there were definitely problems with the contracts as they were, were specified. And uh, I've said this to others who have asked that, I don't have enough knowledge to be able to tell if those problems were such that they could be fixed in future updates or if it was better to do as now has been done to scrap them temporarily and hopefully bring them in in uh, 23 or something. What problems did you see that you hope they do fix if it ever comes back? Well, one thing that is just plain evil is that they... (laughs) They said that if you if you pass a parameter to a function by by value and uh, you use that value in a post condition, then it was uh, undefined behavior if the implementation of that function uh, changes that parameter in any way. Okay. And that is just asking for trouble. People will people will make that mistake. It's uh, the, the validity. Yeah, that, that is worth coming to also. Uh, the contract, the precondition and postcondition is something you specify typically on the interface because it's uh, on the declaration because it's a, a, it's an agreement between the caller and the implementation. So it, it makes sense to state it uh, at the declaration. And now you have something where the validity of or the legality rather of a postcondition that you state in the declaration depends on how the function is implemented and now the bad things would come from that absolutely <laughs> uh, another thing that is uh, problematic is that the way the way they were proposed is that all preconditions and postconditions were checked inside the function body so the the, the code generated by the compiler to do the precondition and postcondition check came in First in the implementation for the precondition and last in the implementation for the postcondition. And a problem with that is when you want to um, to test contracts because uh, normally you definitely you, well this is controversial people will hate me for this uh, but <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that normally you if you have a contract violation you don't want to continue program execution because you have just said that my function requires this to be true to be able to do anything meaningful, and it's not true. Therefore, there's no use uh, continuing. And it's not really a good idea to throw exceptions either, because uh, a contract violation is by definition a bug. 
and the person who wrote the buggy code is very unlikely to catch an exception and do something useful with that. Mm. So you don't continue. But then comes the issue, how do I test uh, the contract then? Because the, the, well, you want the program to, to die, hopefully, with the meaningful information. Um, so how do you test it? Well, you can say that, yeah, mm -hmm. but sure, do a... Uh, um, instrument your, your uh, violation handler such that it throws an exception. But since the violation handler is called inside the function body, it means that you, you still get a hard terminate if the function is uh, no accept. So right. that is problematic. And also, the, this might be uh, that I didn't quite understand this, so maybe it's not really a problem with uh, the proposal as it was, but it was really unclear to me how, how shared libraries were to be handled if if they can be compiled with uh, the different... Uh, the thing with the proposal was that you can say, this makes sense, this is really good. You, you can state your uh, preconditions and postconditions on, uh, on a uh, level. So you can say, for example, in debug builds, I want uh, everything checked, uh, super expensive checks. But in, uh, in release, maybe I just have super cheap checks as a sanity check to ensure that nothing is totally off uh, and the question then becomes how how does a full program behave that uses shared libraries that are built with different uh, different support for different levels I don't know sounds like an ABI issue <laughs> maybe related I don't know but uh, like I said that it's perfectly possible that this was uh, actually adequately described I just didn't understand it uh, Standard ease is not always easy to understand. Uh, or almost never easy to understand. <laughs> yeah. Are you hoping that contracts do make it back into C++ 23? Oh, yeah. Yes, definitely. I, I do. So one thing that also to, to just to be clear, there's, uh, there's no, it's not a necessity to have language support for contracts to be able to program with contracts. You, you can use it with uh, libraries, etc. But hmm. I think it's good to have it in the language because then we can have it uh, visible in the uh, in the declarations, uh, in the header files or modules. Uh, and also, when they are standardized, it means that third-party libraries will use the same, t the same uh, mechanism. Right. Everybody will use the same mechanism. Otherwise, you will see one library uses this solution, another library uses another solution, and it's, it just becomes a, a little bit messy. Uh, and also, when it is standardized, it means that you will get support from tools. So uh, maybe IDEs will be able to just flag what the preconditions are on a function call or something such, which mm. could be pretty neat, I think. Definitely. Uh, what... Contract libraries are you familiar with? I don't think we've ever talked about any like third party mm. contracts libraries. On top of my head, I actually don't know any. I think there is one in Boost. I think there is one in yeah. Boost, but uh, I haven't used it. You can pretty much just say there is one in Boost. And you're probably <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that, that is almost always That's true. true. Yeah. Unless it's a GUI library. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also had a, a talk last year on, on type safety at ACCU. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, what, what, what does that talk go into? Do you consider C++ to be a type safe language? Uh, yes, but with caveats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the built-in types uh, are, are just terrible. Uh, everything is converged to everything, more or less. Uh, with, uh, with a little bit of luck, you will get uh, sane warnings. But uh, it's uh, it's really bad for them. But if if you think about it, if you if you write a class, which conversions are allowed to and from that class, well, the ones that you write, everything is forbidden by default. So with when you write your own types, when you write your own structure or classes, then I would say that yeah, it's it's really 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 strong, unless you choose to open it up with uh, the implicit constructors and implicit conversion operators continuously frustrates me that the standard library has so many implicit conversions built in. At least with W conversion, I can get warnings if I'm doing float and 64 or whatever. But between optional and shared pointer and 
file system path and string and const character pointer. There's so many implicit conversions in the standard library. Yes. yes. And Do you have any uh, solution? No, that, that is a problem. Uh, frankly, it is. Uh, the only thing I can see is that, ju- just as I say, that you you don't want uh, primitive types in your APIs if, if you can get away from it. You, you want your own specific types. Uh, and maybe we should treat the uh, the types in the standard library the same way that we we create our own encapsulations of them with with uh, our defined semantic meaning mm. and our defined conversions. But the problem with that is, of course, that it's a uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of typing. <laughs> uh, something I was just discussing with my students and thinking about myself is um, I, I was I did not appreciate that multi-parameter constructors and default constructors can be themselves marked explicit, and that changes the meaning in some cases. Yes. Uh, I, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, should we make all constructors explicit? All is a strong word. Um, okay. <laughs> but, I think it, but I think it's a good default, yes, to do that. Uh, the thing that changes is that if, um, say that if you have a constructor that takes two parameters, uh, say, and you mark it explicit, and you have uh, an uh, array of such objects, then you cannot uh, initialize the array with each element just being uh, curly braces. You, you have to you have to save the type in front of everyone, which can be annoying, uh, can be quite verbose, uh, but it also reduces the risk for accidentally creating something that wasn't what you thought it was. Right. So, but what this sort of comes to is that you can get surprisingly far with uh, getting rid of a lot of the repetitive typing of pretty much the same thing over and over and over, but for different types with uh, with library solutions. So, uh, I believe it was uh, Jonathan Miller who first started that with uh, his TypeSafe library. I don't remember its name. If it was strong type or safe type and, uh, and then you have you have had a, there are a number of uh, follow ups uh, Peter Somalad has one Anthony Williams has has one that I know of uh, I have one that is uh, very experimental don't use it uh, <laughs> other than to experiment with uh, and I know of, uh, of a few others also and it, it, it takes away a, a lot of the repetition there is some boilerplate unfortunately required because you need uh, you need tags tag types to uh, uh, to distinguish b- between uh, strong types of the same underlying type. Um, okay. But uh, so which means that you either have to create a, a nonsense tag type or use uh, CRTP. Uh, both are boilerplatey. Uh, and the this uh, library solution fails completely if you want to use. Uh, Want to use them for uh, for more complex types like std string, for example, because you have a, a huge number of uh, member functions, and how do you how do you make those visible in a way that does not require a lot of uh, repetitive typing? You you just can't. Well, you can you could do something that inherits publicly from it, but that's kind of defeats the purpose. So. Um, I'm toying with the idea that maybe meta classes can help there, but I haven't had the time to dive into it. Our first earliest chance for meta classes is 2023 at yep. this point. See what happens. So, so what you're saying is that I have a few years to experiment, right? <laughs> yeah, a few years. By the time you come up with the optimal solution, there will be a different solution that's better. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> but um, that doesn't mean it's not worth trying, right? That's how we, right. advance, sure. how we advance our knowledge. Yeah, there's some things I've been playing with lately, just on this. I don't get into any details or anything. That I, Within uh, 200 lines of code, you can have something implemented that C++ 98 would have taken literally thousands of lines of code when it comes to some metaprogramming techniques and mm. constructs for compile time things, and yeah. type generation. Yeah, C++ 98 uh, metaprogramming was pretty painful. Yeah. And and simply having very attic templates, so whatever, just yeah. makes so many things so much easier. Yeah. Fortunately, the language seems to be getting better. Definitely. 
Okay. Uh, Bjorn, is there anything else you want to go over before we let you go today? Uh, yeah. Uh, if you're in Stockholm, come to our, our meetup. We have a pretty vibrant uh, C++ community here. So at the very least, get in touch and uh, get a chance to geek out with uh, like-minded people. Uh, but why not propose a guest talk or, or sponsor us for that matter? Mm. Uh, and also a shout out to the, we have a, it actually, originally it was Sweden CPP that was in fact Stockholm CPP, but now we have uh, changed this so that Sweden CPP is sort of an uh, umbrella organization in uh, quotes uh, for, uh, for the Swedish uh, C++ user groups. So go to swedencpp.se and see what which is the user group closest to you uh, and when they are the, when they have events meetups uh, and uh, if you want to start one and it's you're not living in one of those towns get in touch so we can help you mm-hmm. and if you or for that matter if you have a user group and you're not listed definitely get in touch uh, do you have some specific uh, meeting coming up in the next couple of weeks to tell the listeners about uh, I think I will have Actually, I have to look. I think uh, Malmo is meeting tonight, right? Ah, as oh, well, speak. that might be too late for our listeners. Yeah, <laughs> listeners not, not. Um, yeah. no, uh, Lean Shopping is meeting on the 12th, uh, December ah. 12th. So now you know, go there. Okay. <laughs> I will not be making it. Maybe Rob will. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you will be very welcome there. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today again, Bjorn. Well, thanks for having me again. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Lefticus on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. At cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.